Hi, everyone, and welcome to Jack's Tech Talk, formerly Mice Tech Talk, with the technical information scientists of the Jackson Laboratory. My name is Janine Lomar Kelly, and I am a technical information scientist. And my role is to help you with all of your research related questions through education and practical advice. So some of you longtime viewers might notice we recently changed the name of our show. I wanted to assure you that we are the same people and it's a very similar format as before. This new name reflects our future of thought provoking topics and practical solution based content. For anybody who's watching live, you can use the comment section of the video to say hi and to tell us where you're viewing from. And of course, ask those questions that you can and we'll try and answer those live. So today, let's talk pharmacokinetics for antibody development. So as a result of the global pandemic, probably many of you have been paying attention to different therapies that are being developed for treating COVID-19. And most recently, the US FDA has been issuing several emergency use authorizations for several monoclonal antibodies in particular to treat mild and moderate COVID. So what I wanted to talk about today was one of the many steps that are involved in the drug development pipeline to get those monoclonal antibodies to clinic, and that is to understand the pharmacokinetics of that monoclonal an antibody. And in particular, I wanted to focus on a mouse model that is called TG32HFC. So we don't have a lot of time to get into those uh, the full development process, um, but JAX is hosting a live three-day event next week that is the Antibody Drug Development Summit that I do recommend that all of you interested in uh, drug development uh, registers for using the link in the video description. So with regards to PK or pharmacokinetics, PK is basically going to help you answer the question of how long is your therapeutic going to be available in the circulation to work? And to help me answer those questions, I'm joined by my colleague, Greg Christensen, who is an expert in this mouse TG32 in vivo platform. Hi, Greg. Hello. <clears throat> yeah, so my background is that I got started right from the beginning when these mice were introduced in Derry Rupinian's lab, it was my project to characterize these mice. And uh, we continued to develop new versions of them, adding on the skid mutation, for example. And uh, then about seven, eight years ago, I moved over to the Jack services when my boss, Derry, was going into retirement. And I've been doing client studies and continuing to characterize these mice and uh, introduce new models, such as this uh, TG32HFC mouse. Great. So for those of you who are joining us, maybe they don't know what TG32 is, but we'll start at the beginning. Um, so monoclonal antibodies, particularly those of the IgG subclass, have been really attractive molecules for um, developing therapies, particularly because you can engineer their variable regions and then achieve uh, target specificity. But there's also another really important component of IgGs, which is their ability to have a really long half-life in circulation of about three weeks, um, as compared to other Ig subclasses, such as IgA and IgM, for example. So Greg, what is it about IgG that makes it so distinct um, from those other Ig Ig subclasses that allows IgG to have such a long half-life? So the IgG isotypes, they bind to a receptor called FCRN. And FCRN uh, is within a pathway such that when the antibodies are internalized and the pH of those endosomes are lowered as they're approaching the lysosomes, the lower pH causes the IgG antibodies, not the IgM or IgE, but the IgG to bind to FCRN. And then they are transported back up to the surface of the cell. And uh, at neutral pH, they're released back into circulation. And, and so that's how they, they gain their long half-life. Right, and it's because of that binding to the unique sequences on the FC of IgG as opposed to the other uh, Ig subclasses um, yeah. that can't bind FCRN. 
great. That's right. Yeah, so in terms of drug development uh, and the pipeline, we kind of think about rodent models as well as non-human primate models to measure pharmacokinetics in vivo. Can you tell me a bit about how they're used and maybe some advantages and disadvantages to those? Yeah, so, you know, uh, monocle antibody therapeutics, they got introduced about 30 years ago. And that was before any human FGRM transgenic mice existed. So wild type mice were used instead or non-human primates. And uh, because of the sequence differences between human FCRN and mouse FCRN, the uh, human antibody therapeutics, they don't bind with the same affinities. And so they're not good predictors of how uh, a particular antibody will perform in a human patient. Uh, Non-human primates are quite accepted. The FDA uh, views them as a good model for predicting performance in human patients. And as a result of publications in the last uh, five years or so, let's say, um, we've seen that the TG32 mouse, which expresses human SRN, is at least as good, if not better, than the non-human primate. And that, in addition to the ethical reasons of using uh, non-human primates for uh, lots of studies, uh, this mouse becomes quite important for this characterization. Yeah, I wanted to highlight that point you made about the, you know, the ability for these TG32 mice having the human, full-length human FCRN um, and how that can be used potentially in place of some of those non-human primate studies for those ethical considerations. Um, yep. Certainly the FDA is the one that kind of decides um, you know, whether a drug is going to go further. But uh, I think that's a really important consideration from a development standpoint is the, the ethics of the animal models that we're choosing as well. So um, with regards to the TG32 model, Greg, you know, you've basically described how um, FDA is starting to um, see, you know, accept TG32 as one of those uh, you know, predictable models. There's been a lot of support in the literature and you yourself have run hundreds of studies with probably a thou over a thousand different um, test articles. Uh, so there's a lot of acceptance, um, gaining acceptance for this TG32 model. You actually wanted to talk about an improvement on that model itself. Um, what kind of improvements can you make um, aside from the, this really translatable PK that you can get from these, these mice? Um, what, what kind of room for improvement is there? Right, right. So that's a really good question. Um, as accepted as a, you know, the TG32 model is, um, the one thing that is missing in that model is uh, competing IgG antibodies, uh, and that's because mouse IgG does not bind to human FCRN. So the TG32 mice with their human FCRN are in kind of an empty system. When you put your therapeutic in, uh, that therapeutic is binding to human FCRN and the mouse albumin is binding, but uh, there's no competition between mouse albumin and the therapeutic that you might be testing. And so that lack of competition is not as well modeling what happens in the human patient where, of course, there would be human IgGs competing with your therapeutic. So that's the reason we we went to the trouble of making this model. Um, we wanted to uh, make it available so that uh, you could test out uh, your therapeutics and uh, have this competition available. Right, because the FCRN only has so many binding spots for IgG, and so it, that, you know. Meanwhile, you're trying to uh, test your therapeutic in a PK, but there's also other IgGs that are there uh, in a patient that are going to be using the same pathway and the same molecule. Right. Um, so, yeah. In addition to this kind of um, more physiologically relevant competition, um, you you also cited. Oh, actually, I wanted to get back to um, how it was that you, you guys tested this uh, side by side with the TG32 model. So when you are um, uh, using your therapeutic or your test article, 
um, and using the TG32HFC model, how does that compare? How did the, the half-life change as compared to uh, testing that same molecule in TG32 without that comp competing factor? Right. So just as Bramble showed in his original publication that came up with the idea for a receptor that he called FCRN uh, in 1964, um, he showed that mouse and rabbit antibodies, as those antibody levels, IgG, went up, the half-life was shortened. And uh, Waldman showed this in 1970 publication uh, for human patients. And so what we found in our TG32 HFC mouse, when it was naive, there was a, a, a low level of competition. And when we immunized those mice so that their chimeric IgG1 uh, human chimeric antibody would that level would go up, the competition was increased. And so it demonstrated uh, just what was seen in those original publications, that FCRN is saturable, and uh, this TG32HFC mouse uh, would demonstrate that property of FCRN, and also be a potential better model for the human patient in terms of characterizing antibody therapeutics. Great. So um, in addition to providing that kind of normal IgG competition, you cited two potential other uses for this TG32 HFC model. Um, what would those be from a drug development standpoint? Yeah, so um, if you have closely matched therapeutics that have uh, nice long half-lives, and you want to be able to pick your lead, you know, whether you've got two or you've got 10, and they're, they're all really well matched, and you want to be able to separate them out so you can choose the very best one. Um, if you make the competition a little more stringent, one way is to reduce the FCRN function, and that's what the TG276 mouse does. That's a different model that we have. Or you could reduce the FCRN function uh, by having competition. And that's what the TG32HFC mouse does. With its endogenous uh, human antibody, uh, there would be competition. And the uh, closely matched antibodies would now be better separated in terms of their protection. Uh, because of that competition, and you could more easily choose your lead candidate. Um, so that's one use, um, and that would be, in particular, that would be uh, good for if, if you had an FC variant that, say, had a YTE mutation uh, in it, uh, and you wanted to be able to separate out the different versions of, of that variant. Uh, so, and then the, the other use, a uh, potential use for this model would be, uh, in theory, these mice are tolerized to the human IgG FC. And so this mouse could be used then to avoid anti-drug antibodies that occur with a certain frequency, about maybe five to 10% of the therapeutics that we test have anti-drug antibodies that occur. And while they don't predict what will happen in the patient, what they do is they shorten your study so much because of an immune complex formation and being removed from circulation that you can't generate good PK data. And so this mouse, by being tolerized to the therapeutics, whether they're the monoclonal antibodies or the FC fusions, uh, they wouldn't make those or would make those antibodies less. And so that could be another characteristic of this model that uh, would be an improvement. Yeah, what you're saying is essentially there are certain you know, test articles that could potentially generate an immune response and then cause that 
uh, the mouse to try and protect itself, of course, right? It's trying to remove these kind of foreign molecules. So by supplying a transgenic human IgG from essentially birth, that mouse would in, in theory be tolerized to that um, and it wouldn't be, you know, a for wouldn't be recognized as foreign potentially. That's and then your other, yep. And then your other uh, point about, um, you know, trying to pick a, a winning uh, lead candidate, it's kind of like, putting it into this competition allows the one that, you know, binds the best to really stand out because it, maybe it's not, it has to work harder, but it, you know, has, has more characteristics that allow it to take advantage of that um, FCRN binding as compared to maybe another one. That's right. Great. So um, I think that's all the time we have this week for our Jax Tech Talk. Thank you to Greg. And also there was a secret, um, Con contributor to this show, Elena Gonzalo Gill, who couldn't join us. And the reason she couldn't join us is because she's actually running these um, studies on behalf of clients right now and had a very important um, experiment that needed to be run right now. So I'm, gl I'm, I'm sure that client is happy that she's not on our show today. <laughs> so I did want to let you all know that we do have a few links in the video description. The first one is that registration link to the JAX Drug Development Summit for next week. So please register for that and I plan on attending. I think Greg will be there too. Um, second, if you are interested in talking to Greg or Elena about running a study, uh, PK study with us using any of the models that we talked about today, I've linked our therapeutic antibody evaluation services page second. And then last link is a link to our blog on FCRN biology, including um, information about that basic TG32 model, the TG276 that Greg mentioned briefly, as well as the immunodeficient and albumin variants as well. So if you're um, uh, developing an FC fusion or even an albumin fusion, we also have options for that as well. Yeah. All right, so thank all of you for joining us this week. Our next Jax Tech Talk is called Let's Talk Jax Swiss Outbread, which will be live on Tuesday, June 29th. Follow Jax Tech Talk on LinkedIn or subscribe on YouTube. This is Janine saying stay healthy, stay safe, and stay excited about research. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.